conversation, there are different spectators, there are different stakeholders in this conversation when it comes to talk about issues to do with climate change. Now, there is the government and there is also the church. Today, I want to talk about the presence of the church in this conversation. Remember, at COP28, the very first uh, COP where the church was given a platform to express itself, the religious bodies were given a platform to express themselves at that high level. And to have this conversation is Dr. Ezekiel uh, Lesmore from the Africa Conference, All Africa Conference of Churches, as we have this discussion. Uh, Dr. welcome on Planet Action as we have this discussion. You are at COP28 um, in Dubai, and the very first COP that gave the religious bodies an opportunity to express themselves. Just how significant was that? Yeah, I mean, this is. Um Thank you very much um, for inviting me, um, and indeed I'm carrying the voice of the faith community or constituency in the continent of Africa that is committed to climate justice. And when we talk about climate justice from our own part, we're talking about stewardship of creation, that's creation care, uh, that it is very critical. So it is not just an economic obligation, but it is both moral and ethical obligation. And so at COP2028, 20, 20, it was significant and historical because there you have the faith pavilion where the faith communities around the world found space to express, to convey to the world that, look, we are not just only preparing people for some kind of paradise, but that this is our paradise. We have an obligation to keep the Mother Earth safe for all of us. So we look at the ecosystem that everyone has a responsibility. So COP28 was significant, but of course, uh, the significance in itself, it's also contingent on the outcomes uh, of, of COP2028. So many religious leaders, uh, those who are engaging in climate action, informed by their religious orientation, found expression. And so, very historical. And we hope that this will be the case going forward. Mm -hmm. And as we have this discussion, our different stakeholders, government, uh, we know President William Ruto is big on matters climate change. And uh, he also organized the very first Africa Climate Summit in Nairobi, Kenya, that then came up with, an, uh, with the Nairobi Declaration, a document that formed the basis upon which Africa was going to take their agenda to, um, to, to, to COP28. But now let's talk about the role of the church locally in talking to the constituents, to the congregation on matters to do with climate change. What is the message that the church is giving um, the followers, the brethren? Yeah, I mean, as a, as a faith entity informed by our Christian orientation and call, um, the All Africa Conference of Churches, we, we have a slogan that guides us in our engagement around climate justice, uh, which is also taken from Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7. That, that Of course, it is about the exilic experience of the children of Israel that were in exile. But there, Yahweh, God, who took them to exile, said, you don't know how long you are going to be there but seek the prosperity and the welfare of your host community. So that is where we drew our own slogan, that the welfare of the earth is our welfare. Now, how we take care of the earth, the earth will also take care of us. And we are shifting away from this conversation where you emphasize on human beings as the crown of creation where some biblical texts have been misinterpreted to mean that human beings have been given power to subdue, to destroy, to do whatever with the other creation. So we are saying, no, we are only privileged to have subconscious mind to be able to be rational in whatever we are doing. So we are saying we have a responsibility here on earth to take care of the ants, to take care of the rocks, to take care of the trees, and everything that constitutes the ecosystem and biodiversity. 
And so it is a moral, spiritual, ethical obligation. And so that is where we always say that, look, we have a responsibility. And God, the creator, gave us a responsibility where he say, take care of the earth. Mm -hmm. And taking care of the earth does not mean you should plunder the earth. Does not mean you should rape the earth. Does not mean that you destroy the earth but that you have an obligation to ensure that the ecosystem is intact and it serves humanity. And now, um, um, uh, Reverend, as we have this discussion on, on um, taking care of the earth, one of the biggest conversations even at, uh, at, at COP28 was going zero, going net zero. And this is a big conversation because when you say we don't plunder the earth, we don't destroy it, we know that that's exactly what we've done. We've continued to drill for fossil fuels. We've continued to look for minerals. And then other nations have benefited from that. Therefore, as a continent that is vast with all these resources, mm. how do we make sure that we tell them to take care of the earth? Um, in return, it will pay them back while convincing them that uh, there is another way of doing business as opposed to, uh, say, drilling. You are absolutely right from your analysis. The, the fact is that when you look at the development trajectory of what you can say the so-called industrialized developed nation, okay, and they benefited from the plundering of the mother earth. We have always said as committed people of faith and institution that the mother earth was plundered, particularly Africa. So Africa has been classified and is still like a raw material continent. So exploitations of all sorts have been done here in the continent of Africa. And we have said Africa contributes the least when it comes to global emission. But yet Africa bears the most brunt, the painful part of it. We are suffering the tremendous consequences of climate change for a reason that we know nothing about because we did not contribute to it. And so, now in Africa is told, don't explore, don't dig down because some people need to survive. I mean, to the extent that where issues of carbon market have been introduced, you know, to say, oh, look, uh, the carbon sink in Africa, you can do some sequestering and all of those things, and Africa will benefit from it. So it raised a fundamental moral and ethical question. For example, if the industrialized nation will say, okay, don't dig down, don't get involved in fo uh, fossil fuel for your development, because, I mean, that is what industrialized the nations okay, of the developed nations. But yet you are saying, Africa, no. These resources that you have, for example, Congo DRC, we know. What is lying beneath Congo DRC alone is worth over $20 trillion. How can DRC Congo be at peace? Because there are some who are interested in taking out those minerals. So what we are saying, the industrialized nation if they will be truth to themselves, take away deceit and hypocrisy and lies, okay? And commit truly to the loss and damage fund and give adequate funds to our governments in Africa and say, okay, don't do that, but we are committing these billions. And it honestly comes. Not, not this facade that we hear of um, uh, promises, commitment, pledges, that never happen. So you are pushing people that even as faith leaders, we are, we are confronted with this challenge of what is it that we need to tell the people and say, look, don't allow illegal miners to come and mine in your mines, or to come and explore this, or to go to the forest and do some lumbering and all of those things. So we are confronted with that kind of challenge. And this is because the developed nations are not keeping to their commitments. And Reverend, you've read something very important, which is the loss and damage fund. We know yes. even at COP27 uh, at Shamash, exactly. it came up. 
Absolutely. Even if we go back to the that days was, of, uh, of, 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 of Paris Agreement, Absolutely. it was still there, around $100 billion, Absolutely. but you're just doing around 10%. Absolutely. So as we have this discussion today on matters to do with loss and damage, I know they're trying to, in, the, um, the entire conversation is trying to introduce another mechanism of loss and damage. Why is it so difficult for um, the global north, those who bear the greatest responsibility to mm -hmm. give out this money? And maybe is it about time that the promises and that are given in these uh, high level um, engagements come with a responsibility maybe it is a law it is a requirement a global requirement for people to meet their end of the bargain and will africa benefit from such a plan yeah usually that is the challenge the mechanisms that are in place whether you talk about the international financial architecture that requires to be reformed to allow the developing nations to have a say to have a voice to i mean determine what allocations should be concessional free okay in terms of access to those funds usually of course the mechanisms that are put in place are so stringent to the point that you will find that many african countries will never be able to meet up to that but the point is that if we're talking about loss and damage why do you come with such kind of criteria mechanism that you would definitely know that some of these african countries would not be able mm -hmm. because they don't have the patience. Mm -hmm. we are seeking to develop we are seeking to transform and yet you are holding us with all kinds of mechanism but this is not to say again that there's no corruption in africa mm -hmm. our worry again is whether these funds are released to africa our governments will be true to the utilization of these funds but let us not even get there let the developed nation play their part and tell us that, look, we have released this amount of billions to these countries. And that was why, during the Africa Climate Week, from our resolution here as state actors, we made a proposal. The proposal was that, can we adopt the mechanism that worked for the Global Fund to combat HIV, TB, and malaria, what we call the country coordinating mechanism? So that now, all stakeholders, is it the youth, the women, the indigenous people, the civil society, think of all critical stakeholders, will have a space on the table to determine how much is allocated, whether we're talking about renewable energy, how much is allocated, how can the indigenous people who are keeping our forest reserves safe benefit from it? So until we are able to put in place such transparent mechanism. But before we get there, honestly, the developed nations need to play their part, right from Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. 100 billion people celebrated. Paris <laughs> Agreement was awesome. Awesome. We celebrated that 100 billion will be contributed annually. Yes. For goodness sake, have we achieved that since from 2015? Mm -hmm. We haven't. And, uh, Reverend, therefore, brings the question on the need, if any, of having all these global summits. Because Paris Agreement has been there, Glasgow has been there, this is the 28th exactly. conference of climate change, but nothing seems to be coming out of it. While we know there are discussions out there that have come to, uh, to help these discussions, but responsibilities, he who bears the greatest responsibility, um, does not want to meet the end of the bargain. Therefore, how do we move forward as Africans knowing very well that the global north will not meet the end of the bargain? How do we safeguard our continent and these are the places we call home? One, I support that we continue with co-process because it creates what we think a potent space for negotiation. Now, our challenge with that would be whether the negotiations are being done honestly, mm -hmm. transparently, and with a sense of responsibility and accountability. That is where we have a challenge. So it becomes a market space. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, look, we are talking about life and death, and that has been my slogan. Even for us as African Faith Actors Network for Climate Justice under the platform of AACC, 
our popular language is a matter of climate change are matters of life and death. Now, all those who come to the table, but they come as economists. They're talking about profit. And that's where we talk about the question of capitalism, neoliberal economic system, or globalization, where emphasis is placed on profit as against human well-being. So we are asking for the economy of life, an economy that places emphasis on collective well-being of humanity. Otherwise, it may get to the point that some of us we call the heads of state to say, boycott the meeting. And say, if Africa's priority will not truly really be at the top, why would our head of state waste their time to go for such meeting? We boycott it sometimes. And let's see. And now we say, okay, let us develop our own development trajectory or development architecture as Africans. Can we trade among ourselves? When we talk about Agenda 2063, we're talking about a prosperous, peaceful, and integrated Africa. Okay? So, and there are many, many aspects of the Agenda 2063 that if only our heads of state, we are waiting for the outcome of the heads of state summit that ended yesterday. We are hoping that something concrete will come out and issues relating to climate justice will be discussed. Loss and damage must be discussed. Our heads of state, yes, many heads of state are embracing the notion of carbon market. But we are saying, if commitment have not fully been made with regards to Paris Agreement, and at Glasgow we saw the, 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 the games that went on, even in terms of whether facing out or facing down, coal and all of that, and we celebrated in Sharm El Sheikh that loss and, loss and damage uh, uh, fund has been established. Now in uh, COP28, it said, okay, the mechanism has been put in place with commitments that are pledges, huh? mm -hmm. about 500 <laughs> million pledges. But how are we sure that that mm -hmm. will be there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we will get excited about those things, but Africans, we must not be emotionally excited mm -hmm. when such declarations and pledges are made. We should come back home mm -hmm. and look and say, what is good for us as Africans? Yes, we have African group of negotiators who are also doing their best, but sometimes you can see frustration from their faces, but they would want to be diplomatic without expressing that frustration. But the fact is that we are getting tired. We are running out of patience with regard to this deceit and hypocrisy around negotiation for climate justice. And uh, Reverend, you say we are getting tired and we are also running out of time. Because the more we sit uh, and people continue to drill, the worse it gets. Um, and even as we talk about this, we're just from the worst drought in over Absolutely. four decades. Absolutely. As we speak right now, flood uh, rains came, Absolutely. it was flooding. It is super hot in Nairobi Absolutely. today. today. Therefore, as locals, as Kenyans, how do we approach the entire conversation on climate change? I know uh, uh, issues to do with the carbon credits has been brought, but experts say carbon credit is giving someone else the license to continue polluting. That's it. Therefore, even as we are planting trees, we are given a holiday by the president. Yes. But how do we make sure that even while we are planting uh, trees, and going for this carbon market and, and the business around it, that those who are drilling also reduce their drilling by, say, 20% annually, so that in the next five years, everyone is carbon zero. I mean, the point is, people are hungry. Mm -hmm. Poverty is biting. The, the dollar has gone down. Oh, Kenyan shillings have gained in value. But, I went to the shop to check whether the price of unga has gone down. Mm -hmm. I realized it has not. Mm -hmm. Okay, we are excited that yes, the, the Kenyan, Kenyan shillings have appreciated. Okay, so now the reality is that those people who are drilling, who are involved in drilling, that seem to be their source of income. Mm -hmm. So morally, what alternative are we offering to them? Mm -hmm. So that they are kept away from doing that. And yet, those who are saying, let us plant trees. Mm -hmm. Okay, sometimes I crack a joke and I say it. Now we are told to plant 
billions of trees. Eh? 15 billion trees. Yes. So now the question is, how many trees have been planted in Europe? Mm -hmm. How many trees have been planted in America? <laughs> Why is it that Africa should plant trees? Mm -hmm. And look, when we talk about uh, carbon market, sometimes I say, look, let us not divorce it from neo-colonialism. And why Africa is even suffering? I mean, I remember in uh, Shamal Sheikh, I was, I was speaking in a side event, and I said, look, this is a matter of racism. Look at COVID-19. When it hit the entire world, the vaccine was discovered how, how long? We, we were suffering with HIV here. The vaccine never came because they say, this is an African disease. So it is with climate change. And I hope they hear that it is about racial justice. And it is because Africans are suffering. It is Africans that are bearing the brunt. And I'm saying it to appeal to the conscience of those in power that we cannot take it. We are supporting our governments to be our voice in such negotiation. And they should speak. Forget about diplomacy. It is about a matter of life and death. Therefore, a Reverend, as a church, um, um, when you engage with the government on matters to do with, um, with climate change, what is your recommendation to, to the government on how they should proceed moving forward, knowing that uh, assist from the West seems not to be coming? So therefore, in terms of locally, uh, uh, locally generated solutions to our own problems, climate change, our floods, our... Um, our drought, what is your message to the government and to any other Kenyan and African mm, who's watching mm. right now? Now, I mean, the, the point is let us remember that matters of climate change are matters of life and death. And secondly, this is what we usually tell governments, whether in Kenya or in any part of Africa that matters of climate change cannot be objectified, cannot be commercialized, and cannot be politicized. Don't politicize them. Don't commercialize, because it's a matter of life and death. And as government, you are there in power because the people of Kenya, the people of Africa have voted you in. Please, do what is beneficial to the people. Utilize the resources that we have. Do not play into global politics. Speak truthfully on our behalf. There are spaces that we will not have access to, but you as government and government representative will have access to. Please speak truth to them. And as Kenyans and as Africans, please let us do our part to take care of the environment. Mm -hmm. Plant tree as you are able to. Clean the drainages, ensure that our biodiversity is safe intact. And I call on the government, listen to the indigenous people, because we need to also embrace locally led initiative on adaptation and mitigation in order to build resilient community. And there are nature-based solutions. Why can't our government listen to our indigenous people who are out there saving the Mother Earth? Listen to them. There are nature-based solutions that we can deal with it. Reverend Dr. Lesmore Ezekiel, Director of Programs at the All Africa Conference of Churches says, that you and I must play our part, that the government must be truthful when it talks about issues to do with climate change, that those who bear the greatest responsibility should 